Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria. And if you haven't been here before, or we haven't met, my name is Carrie Hunter, and I'm the spiritual, spiritual director of the Center. And it's lovely to have you here with us today. If you ever want to drop in and in person, we have our services at the Cook Street Village Activity Center at 380 Cook Street in Victoria. And um, we meet in the morning, 1030 Sunday morning for meditation and 11 o'clock for our regular service. And we'd be absolutely delighted to have you drop in to pay us a visit and to get to know you. So today, um, you know, we're halfway in between Remembrance Day. Uh, with it falling next Wednesday, and I always like to do a, a Remembrance Day service, and uh, and you know have often have different ideas about what it is that uh, that is meaningful, particularly personally, during that day. And someone sent me a video a few days ago, and it was very very touching. I had seen it a few years ago, but it really is something that profoundly moves me. And it's it's a video, black and white. Um, during wartime and second, the Second World War. And it's the story of um, a German pilot um, who was approaching a British plane and was going to shoot it down. And we, when he got within shooting range, he noticed that the plane was just in tatters. The gunner um, was dead or wounded. He was slumped over, slumped over his gun. And the pilot was doing everything that he could to just keep afloat. And when he saw this, he, he realized that the pilot was going the wrong direction. He was headed back to Germany. And there was something in him that just really moved him profoundly at the time. And so he, he, he got to eye level with the pilot in the, in the small aircraft and, and waved at him and signaled that he needed to turn around and go the other way. And then he guided him. He guided him back close to England so that the pilot could go in for a landing. He didn't know, of course, whether or not he would make it safely, but the pilot did. And neither of them ever forgot that incident. And to me, it was such a really moving thing to know that, that, that someone who, or people who were on opposite sides, basically, reached a point where one of them simply had to help a fellow being. And isn't that really what life is all about? It happens that those two pilots somehow met again many years later and recalled the incident. And the, the British pilot asked why um, the German pilot hadn't shot him down. And he said, when I saw how vulnerable you were, how vulnerable your aircraft was, there was no way that I could do that. Something in me said that I, I had to guide you home. That moves me for a whole lot of reasons, not the least of which is that my father was a pilot in the RAF, and he didn't have anyone who guided him home. He was shot down during the war. He was shot down over Germany, and he was killed, and I never knew him. Uh, my mother was pregnant with me at the time. So Remembrance Day for me has always, you know, had a bit of, a, a bit of sadness attached to it, and at the same time, just so many questions like how could anyone shoot somebody else down or how could people come face to face and shoot one another? How can troops go into combat? How can any of this ever happen? And I'm sure that almost all of us ask ourselves that same question many times over. I, I was thinking about it again the other day and I googled to see how many people were killed in wars in, in the last century. It was estimated that probably about 150 to 160 million people were killed in the last century in, in one of the many wars. And that throughout recorded history, it's closer to a billion people. Think about that, a billion people. You know, um, 150 million, 160 million is, you know, compare that with the population of Canada. And, and consider how many, how much of our population would have been destroyed over and over and over again if we'd had that number of casualties. And goodness knows that we did, um, we did have a lot of them. 
And I was remembering in my childhood, um, a couple of my uncles had been to war, but I didn't really understand what that was about. And I think, you know, when I was about two years old, I was sitting on my grandfather's knee. And one of the rules of the house was that when the six o'clock news came on, nobody was allowed to speak. And so I was sitting there just, you know, in quiet. And when the news broadcast was over, it was CBC, and it was 15-minute newscast at 6 o'clock at night. And I remember looking at my grandfather and saying, why are the Germans bad guys? And he looked at me, and he, he didn't speak. He couldn't speak. And I remember it so vividly, because, because somehow in his silence there was an incredible amount of meaning. And I didn't know as a little girl just what that was. But I, I can feel it now. I mean, how can we look at others as our enemies? You know, when we're all one, we all have spirit within us. Each one of us is a, an individualized expression of God. How can, we, how can we create these enemies? And I don't think that any of us really does. I think it's more of, more of the political systems in which we live that do that kind of thing. But comes a time where enough already. You know, we, just, we just have to say enough. Now, I've thought that enough happened a long time ago. And yet we still have people um, out in the military today we still have deaths, we still have violence, we still have hatred. Those are not the God qualities with which we were born. It's not the way that we're supposed to live. And, you know, just th think of the number of people who were killed in war, but that that's minimal compared with the number of people who were, were physically wounded. And then imagine the emotional wounds that they carry with them as well throughout their lifetime. I don't know how anybody really gets over that. God bless them all. And so as I look at this, and I, I think, well, you know, what is it? What is it that each of us can do? And perhaps the bigger question is, what is mine to do? Because obviously each of us has a role in this. Each of us has something we can do. We can't just, you know, put our heads under the covers and pretend that these things are not happening. And I remember uh, Mother Teresa saying, when she was talking about war and peace, and she said she would go nowhere, absolutely nowhere to protest war, but that she would go anywhere to stand for peace. And I thought, really, isn't that what it's all about? It's time that we stand for peace. You know, and, and as we go into Remembrance Day, we do remember our losses. We remember loved ones who are lost. We remember, you know, young, young, young men and, and some women you know, who, who were killed. And it all seems so senseless. And yet they, you know, bravely went for whatever they thought was the good of their country out of patriotism. But so did people on the other side. And a number of years ago, I was in, um, in Spain um, making a film uh, and I was with my partner, and, and on the way home, we had a stopover in Frankfurt. And that evening, we went out for a walk. It was a beautiful evening, starry sky. And we hadn't walked very far, and we came upon a church. And that church had the old, old, old steeple and a, a small portion of an old building. And then there was this modern building that was, was attached to it. And we stood there just kind of staring, and we were both very quiet, and we were both thinking exactly the same thing, that this was a part of Frankfurt that had been bombed during the war, and that there were still parts of buildings that stood afterward, and the new buildings were attached to them. The, the older buildings were not leveled. And I had tears. I was choked, and so was my partner. His father had been killed in the war as well. He was also a pilot and his plane was shot down, and Richard never knew his father. And so the two of us stood there, grieving not just our own fathers, but grieving all of humanity who have suffered so. It was really an awful feeling to be standing there knowing that, that these, these buildings had been destroyed at one time, or almost all destroyed. 
You know, we in Canada have been very, very blessed that we have not had war on our own territory. But to actually th consider that, to stand there, it was a very eerie feeling. Um, it wasn't frightening. It was just so terribly, terribly sad. And each of us were feeling, feeling the wounds of that inside. And, you know, what, what I realize is that we have to just expand our love to all of humanity, not just to those who are our next door neighbors or, you know, the, our friends, our families. It has to go way beyond that. As we stood there in front of that church, we weren't angry about the loss of our fathers. We weren't angry that people from that country had shot down their planes. There was just this enormous compassion for everyone everywhere who has ever suffered any kind of loss, knowing that it would not ever be anybody's choice in the beginning. As we're little children growing up, it would not be anybody's choice to go to war, to kill other people, um, to, you know, to lose or to lose loved ones. It's just not in our character to do that. So we need, we need to somehow open up our hearts more. And instead of being critical, instead of being judgmental, instead of hating what somebody else does, um, we need to have greater understanding, greater compassion for them. And that really means putting ourselves in their shoes, just imagining what it's like for them, imagining what it was like for them, imagining where they come from, imagining what their home life was like. Did they have loving parents or did they have no parents or did they have parents who weren't loving, who didn't treat them well, parents who were abusive? We don't know what creates people who sometimes seem like monsters. But what we do need to know is that inside each one was someone's baby child at one time. He or she was once some mother's baby child. And if we can wrap our minds around that, wrap our hearts around that, then perhaps we can learn to love more when we see others and we, we learn to love the God in them, the child in them, and not to go into dark places, not to go into places of hatred, not to go into places where we wish other people ill will. That's just not who we are. Mother Teresa said, you know, it's easy to send food and it's easy to send um, money to other countries, to people who are living in devastating times and who don't have enough to eat, who don't have medical supplies, and so on. But she said it's not so easy to forgive those in our own homes. It's not so easy to forgive our neighbors it's much easier to overlook those things, kind of sweep, sweep them under the rug, say, I don't have to pay any attention to that. But the fact is there are people everywhere who need us. There are people next door. There might be people in our own homes. There are people everywhere. And, it, and it's really time that we move out of a place of complacency or of not wanting to even look at those things, not wanting to even think about those things. And and to come from a more loving place. Because if we're going to create a better world, then that's what we have to do. And the point is that, you know, we're called upon to remember what it's like to lose somebody. We're called, to, we're called upon to think what that would be like. You know, it's, it's a challenging thing to do, especially when on our screens every day we're seeing all kinds of violence and um, terrible things. You know, we don't see in the news every night that you know a certain number of millions of people got home from work safely. We see the, the accidents that happened. We don't see the good things that happened that day. It's, the news is filled with the bad stuff. I think that really harms our psyche. It's, it's really time to look beyond those things. And if we hear that, you know, there was an accident, bless that person, bless the people in the accident, but then be grateful for all the people who made it home safely. Be grateful that we are safe in our own homes. Because when we forget, when we forget these things, we lose part of our humanity. And when we lose our humanity, then all kinds of 
dreadful things can start to happen in the world. We mustn't forget. We have to listen, and that means listening for the truth, for what goes beyond what we can see, for that inner wisdom, that inner truth. Like Dr. Holmes says, we all have the truth within us. When truth comes knocking at the door, we need to open that door and let it in. And sometimes we want to just shut it off. We don't want to think about it. We want to make ourselves really busy. You know, we want to be busy watching television or um, playing a game or doing, doing something that's going to take our minds off the things that are really, really serious and important around us. And the fact is that we do have to open our doors to the truth. We have to open our minds to the truth. We have to see what our roles are in what is going on in the world, and we have to think about what each of us might be able to do to make things different. You know, Buddha said that if we cling to ideas about who the enemy is, then when truth comes in person and knocks at the door, we won't answer it. And we may be turning away something absolutely wonderful. So what is it that we have to do? We have to wake up. We have to listen. We have to choose a new idea. Waking up doesn't mean just waking up in the morning and getting, up, getting out of bed. Waking up means waking up and staying awake, being awake to what is going on in the world around us and asking what is ours to do. Is there something that we can do? If the only thing we can do is to pray, then that is huge because that sends out a vibration, an energy that is really important. But there are other things that we might be able to do as well. And we need to consider those things. We are not meant to be robots, just walking around blindly accepting everything that goes on. You know, there's a, an expression in our teaching, and that's um, treat and move your feet. And of course, when we use the word treat, we are talking about spiritual mind treatment which is also affirmative prayer. So pray and move your feet. Listen. Listen. What is the action that you have to take when you pray? What, what's the divine message that comes through? We need to really you know, be in the silence from time to time to allow ourselves to absorb that information. I'm fond of saying in the silence there are many answers. That's where the inner wisdom comes from, when we allow ourselves to just sit in absolute silence, in stillness, and to see what comes up for us, to see what it is that that great divinity is telling us that we might do, how we might feel, how we can love more, how we can live a life of peace, how we can have inner peace, because it all begins within each of us. When we do get an answer, what's really important is that we choose this new idea for our lives. Choose a new idea. Instead of hanging on to the old ones, instead of hanging on to everything that's gone before us, choose the new idea, the good one, the loving one, the compassionate one, the one that will make the world a better place. You know, it's, it's important to remember that when we're, when we're doing affirmative prayer or spiritual mind treatment, that it clears our minds. It clears the negativity away. It clears everything away. It allows us to co connect with the divine. And we have to remember that prayer is something that is in our toolbox. It's something that we can reach there for at any time, any time. Just pull it out, sit in the silence, and pray. And then sit for a while in the stillness and see what comes back to us. And what comes back is that new idea, that new idea that helps us to create a better life for ourselves and for others. Remember that we're all in this together. And we're all together, you know, despite whatever mess the world appears to be in, we are all in this together. And somebody has to make the first move. Somebody has to make the first move toward peace. 
Somebody has to make the first move toward love, toward compassion, toward understanding. We have to just get out of our own way and reach out, reach out to others, and reach out in any way that we can to start changing the environment around us and to start changing the world. You know, what if, what if we consciously took action, consciously took action on behalf of humans everywhere? What a different world it would be instead of just saying, well, I can't do much about it. You know, um, I've got important things here that I have to deal with. I've got to look after my own life. I've got to look after my own home. Yes, we do. Peace does begin at home. Peace begins with us here. But that does not stop us from reaching out to people everywhere. There are, all, there are different kinds of war in my mind. You know, there are those wars that are the big wars, like World War I and World War II and the Korean War. And, you know, the, I mean, so, ma so many wars that have names attached to them. But I think about those little children who were put in cages on the border between Mexico and the United States. That's a kind of war, too. That's a crime against humanity. What are, what are we going to do about that? Are we even thinking about that these days? What can each of us do? There has to be something. So we can write letters to our political leaders. We can go to our, um, our MPs, to our MLAs. We can ask them to, to do something on our behalf. We can ask this to be raised in the consciousness of our nation, in the, in the consciousness of the world through our leaders. We can't just sit by. Who wants to be around 10, 20, 30 years from now? Still buying red poppies and remembering those we lost in the last decade or in the last couple of years or yesterday. I wear a red poppy in remembrance. I have struggled with that because to me, as a child, it symbolized death the death of my father. But I've reached a point where I recognize that it really is saying, I remember. I am not going to forget, I remember. But I also wear a white poppy, and that's a poppy for peace. And there's a little green symbol in the center of it with the word peace that's written upon it. There aren't very many of them around, but I find that Wherever they are, they're just immediately gone because that's what we're hungry for. Each of us is hungering for a more peaceful place on this planet, for more peaceful lives, for kinder, gentler people everywhere. You know, what if consciousness took action? That's what, really what's required here. It's about a change in our thinking, a change in our consciousness. The absolute desire to create a better world, to create a, a more peaceful world. And we must choose to live consciously. And what that means is to be alert and aware. Not to just close our minds to what's going on around us, to be, but to be aware, to be mindful, to, to ask ourselves over and over again, what can I do? To listen in the silence for the answers. To know that there's a great divinity, the great creator, God, source of all that is, the universe, whatever it is that you want to call it. It's there for us, and we get to use it. As Ernest Holmes said, there's a power for good in the universe, and we can use it. What a remarkable human being he was. And one of my very favorite expressions of his comes at the end of his final sermon by the sea that he gave at Asilomar in California just before he died, where he said, give me 1,000 people who know this, who really know this teaching. And I'm paraphrasing here, but 1,000 people who not only understand it, but that they use it, that we pray, that we meditate, that we do what is good, that we do what is right, 1,000 people who are awake and aware and conscious and who choose the new idea, 
who choose to change the world with their thinking and with their ideas. Give me 1,000 people and there will be peace on earth. Let us hold the vision of peace on earth, peace in our lifetime, coming together with brotherly, sisterly love for one another. Let's remember that as we go into Remembrance Day this week. Thanks for being with me today. Join us again. Join us in person if that moves you. We are social distancing and we're following provincial protocols so that we're as safe as we can be in our facility and we would love to have you with us. And um, whether or not you are with us in person, I will be here each week um, with, a, with a new message. This week it simply is about remembering the truth of who we are each of us is spirit having a human experience, and that means that every single person on this planet is. What we do to someone else, we are doing to spirit. Let us remember that we are all brothers and sisters. We are all united, united in the oneness of God. And so it is. Bless you all. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you again. <laughs>